Hello and welcome back to The Note. Today I'm going to be talking once more to Professor Ricardo Hausmann of Harvard University. In the last interview you saw us discuss his version of economic complexity, how you look at different products and how they're related in an economy. Today I'm hoping to take a look at what this implies for which countries can grow most effectively. Ricardo, thanks for being here again today. Now, as I understand it, the countries in the brightest red here uh, yeah. are those best positioned to, to progress. Tell me how you decided which countries would appear brightest on this heat map. Well, essentially, we, we try to fit a, our theory to the history of growth. And we find that there are three things that explain growth. First one is what happened to natural resources. Mm. Second is uh, how many productive capabilities you currently have. And third is how easy it would be for you to acquire more, meaning how centrally you are located in the map that we have just seen. So those are essentially the three variables we use. And then, obviously, that, those determine how rich you are going to be. And how rich you currently are determines how much you're going to grow. So where are you going vis-a-vis -vis where you start? <laughs> so this says <coughs> that Mexico is better located than Brazil. Because <coughs> Mexico has diversified enormously to a bunch of other industries, aircraft, um, uh, electronics, uh, IT, and right. so on. While uh, Brazil has been moving in the um, opposite direction of concentrating in soybeans, mining, and so on, and, and having a weaker and weaker um, manufacturing base or a, a base of more sophisticated okay, now, now, that's a very interestingly contrarian yeah. position, as Brazil is obviously part of the, uh, the BRICS, which have commanded such attention and interest in Mexico arguably changed a little recently with the, the change in government, but interest in Mexico tends to focus on the fact that it has a very severe drug war going on. But you would still say that, it, broadly speaking, Mexico is now in a better position to grow than Brazil. Absolutely. Brazil is a country that has grown remarkably little in the context of very, very high commodity prices. Uh, so if you think that commodity prices are not going to be a source of growth, that maybe they stay where they are or they decline, then what's going to drive growth is their ability to uh, diversify and move into more complex products, and they're worse positioned than Mexico in doing that. Now, uh, now if we move over to the Middle East and Africa, there are, some again, some uh, findings that many people will find surprising. <coughs> Among those nations marked in red there, we have Zimbabwe, we have Egypt, and Tunisia, and then countries like Qatar show up mm. on your, uh, from your perspective mm. as not being particularly well positioned. Is, th is this because of an oil curse, or how did some of these countries that have been very disrupted in recent years still show up as being in, in a good position? Well, Z Zimbabwe is a country that it's a tragedy, right? They mm. have much more productive capabilities than is expressed in their current level of income. Mm. So if you assume that biology is going to take care of their main obstacle, right there, which is Mr. Mugabe. Yeah. Uh, the country has in uh, know-how in its society that could be expressed into a much larger level of income. Tunisia and Egypt are very well positioned in the product space. If Egypt got its act together, you have, you have a, a, a good manufacturing base that is well located at 140 kilometers from the Mediterranean, 140 kilometers from the Red Sea, uh, that they could move into many, many other things. They have the capabilities uh, uh, that if they just got a little bit of their act together, they would express themselves. And Qatar is yes. just the fact that oil is, you know, uh, starting at 100 and, and plus, uh, as you look forward, you ask yourself the question, is oil going up or is oil going down? It's unlikely to be an additional source of growth, so the rest of the economy doesn't have much to help it. I suppose, finally, we can never discuss emerging markets growth without talking about the... Uh, the gorilla in the room, which is China. A lot of the rest of the world has a lot riding on uh, China's ability to keep growing, so it's encouraging that it shows up in, in red there, as does India. What is, what is China doing right that makes you confident that it has the ability to, to grow from where it is now? I mean, we're projecting it grows at around 4 5%, which is significantly lower uh, than it's currently growing at 7.5%, which is already disappointing. Right, it's significantly so, lower than so, many so in the markets want it to grow as well. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. So, so we would say China slows down, that it cannot keep mm. this act of extremely fast growth. Um, and probably in the process of slowing down, this is not in, in the chart, but in the process of slowing down, they may well have a recession. 
because they have to go from 46 percent uh, investment rate to something more reasonable and it's hard to do that without uh, some period of, of very very slow or negative growth but uh, when you add it all up to 2020 it adds up to something like um, like uh, a five percent growth uh, which would be fantastic uh, but um, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, much less than its current history. Right. Western Europe would certainly take 5% growth yeah. per year from now through to 2020, but China might still be, that might still raise significant political issues in China, you mean? Absolutely. Okay, Ricardo Hausmann, thank you very much indeed. These are big topics, but they're important ones, and I hope that was a very interesting perspective. Plainly, when we talk about emerging market growth, we tend to, uh, people tend to talk in broad abstractions. If you look very much more closely at what's going on at the sources of growth, you can find out some very interesting things.